the President of the United States, accompanied by Senator and Mrs. Gorton. across the country. <laughs> and the second is how much of his time and his effort he has put in to supporting and to building up his political party and Republican candidates. And we thank you for both, Mr. President. to experience the charm and the persuasiveness of this President of the United States. And let me tell you, it's no accident that he's the most popular and most successful President six years after he was first elected in this century. This President has confidence in himself because he has confidence in his country and in people like you from one coast to the other. He has made it more prosperous, he has made it more confident, and he has made it more secure. And now that he thought was a bad bargain and that he could better. <laughs> Gracious and our courageous leader, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you all very much, and thank you, Slade, for that most kind and generous introduction. And the, our master. And, and uh, I love all of you. <laughs> well, our master of ceremonies, Joel Pritchard, a former congressman, and I'm sorry that the schedule didn't call for me here, getting here in time so that I had to miss the Yakima Indian dance. And uh, before I begin, let me say thanks to some great bands, the Washington State University Band. Mm. 
the Central Valley High School Band. The Eastern Washington University Collegians. And the Percussionauts. And let me also mention three members of Washington State's A-Team in Washington, D.C., Senator Dan Evans and Representative Sid Morrison and Rod Chandler, and of course, the State Chairman of the GOP, Dunn Jennifer. And to those here who might have crossed the line from Idaho, I just want to say that you have a tremendous United States Senator, Steve Sims. And I hope you'll reelect him. All right. Now, I can't help but see the young people here in this audience. And uh, I have a special message for you from my roommate. She said, when it comes to drugs, please, for yourselves, for your families, for your future and your country, just say no. Well, it's wonderful to be here in the other Washington. And, uh, and you know, as I often say to my staff when we're taking off in Air Force One, it's get to gr great to get out of Washington, D.C., and to get back where the real people are, as Slade said. Now, you probably know that I couldn't do this much traveling when Congress was in session, as Slade Gorton will tell you. That's because some of those folks back there need watching. <laughs> now, I'm not assailing the institution of the Congress. I respect it mightily. But there are some there that in their approach to business remind me of the three fellows that came out of a building one day and found they'd locked themselves out of their car. And one of them said, get me a wire coat hanger. I'll straighten it out, and I can fix it so I can trip the latch and we get in. And the second one said, you can't do that. Someone will see us and think we're stealing the car. And the third one said, well, we better think of something pretty quick because it's starting to rain and the top's down. <laughs> but that... That story says so much about how the tax and tax, spend and spend policies left our country just a few years ago. Negative growth, double-digit inflation, the highest rate since, and get ready, the highest interest rate since the Civil War. And so as part of the 1980 cleanup crew for the worst economic mess since the Great Depression, Slade Gorton and I headed for Washington. Well, we cut government growth, we slashed regulations, cut income taxes almost 25 percent, and today we're enjoying one of the longest e economic expansions in history. The, the, the prime interest rate has fallen by two-thirds, mortgage and auto loan rates are down, inflation has plummeted from more than 12 percent to 1.8 percent, and And we've created in these just a little less than four years over 11 and a half million new jobs. That's more new jobs than Western Europe and Japan combined put together in the last 10 years. Now, you know, when we started that economic program that led to all of this, there were a lot of critics, and some of them were pretty hostile, and some of them were making fun of us and all of that. I really realized that our plan, though, was working when they stopped calling it Reaganomics. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Just days ago, we learned that the figure that represents the country's economic growth, GNP, the growth national product, and some other indicators show our economy gathering momentum for even more growth, higher take-home pay, and more new jobs. And more recently, we learned that the trade deficit in September declined for the second month in a row and is now 30 percent lower than its peak. <clears throat> Now, this is particularly good news for our manufacturing industries. And we also learned that September sales of single-family homes were up over 10 percent. And just this morning, we learned that the nation's leading economic indicators were up four-tenths of one percent in September. Now, there are three more indications that we're headed for more prosperity. And I'm determined to see that those who still are not sharing fully in our nation's prosperity do so. And I give you my pledge, neither Slade nor I will be satisfied until this expansion reaches every sector of our economy and every home in America, and until every American who wants a job has a job. And to broaden our expansion, I signed into law last week the most sweeping reform of the tax code in our nation's history. For more than 80 percent of Americans, it means a top rate of 15 percent or less. But wouldn't you know it, even before this fair share tax plan reached my desk, the Democratic leadership in Congress was saying they wanted to break faith with the American people and turn the tax reform into a tax increase. You know, the truth is, those folks never met a tax they didn't like. <laughs> and when it comes to spending your hard-earned money, they act like they've got your credit card in their pocket, and believe me, they never leave home without it. But you, the American people, know the truth. We don't have a deficit because we're taxed too little. We have a deficit because the Congress spends too much. <laughs> Isn't it about time the Congress started protecting the family budget instead of fattening the federal budget? You know, when I see what's been happening there back in our nation's capital, it reminds me of a story. You'll find out that when you get to my age, a lot of things <laughs> remind you of stories. Uh, uh, this happened to be a Democratic fundraiser at a downtown hotel. And when the people came out of the hotel, there was a kid selling puppies. He had puppies, and he was saying, buy a Democrat puppy, buy a Democrat puppy. Two weeks later, the Republicans held a fundraiser in the same place. When they were coming out, there was the kid with the puppies saying, buy a Republican puppy, buy a Republican puppy. And a newsman remembered him from two weeks before, and he said, hey, kid, you were here two weeks ago selling those pups as Democrat pups. Now you're back here selling them as Republican pups. How, how come? The kid says, now their eyes are open. But ladies and gentlemen, we've come now to an issue that transcends in importance even all the other crucial matters that I've mentioned. My most solemn duty as president, the safety of the American people and the security of these United States. Now, and, and here too, because of the support of a senator like Slade Gorton, we've been able to restore America's strength. There is nothing I'm prouder of in this job than the two million young men and women who are in our military forces. And you know the arguments that rage and how many people on the other side, politically back in Washington, are always trying to whittle down the defense budget. Well, let me tell you about those young people in the uniform if we must ever ask them to put their lives on the line for the United States of America,
then they deserve to have the finest weapons and equipment that we can produce, and we're going to see they get them. By the way, all of you here in the Spokane area have a special reason for pride. Just two days ago, airmen from Fairchild Air Force Base walked away with the trophy at the Strategic Air Command competition. So, so as Commander-in-Chief, I'd like to give them a special salute. You know, you find out some things about my job. I uh, got to Washington and then I found those young men, those Marines, for example, at the helicopter and everything would always salute. And I was an officer in World War II in civilian clothes. I know I'm not supposed to salute, so I'd try to nod and say hello and hope they'd drop their hand, but they wouldn't. They kept it up there. One night over at the Marine headquarters, I said to General Kelly, the commandant of the Marines, I told him about this, and I said, there ought to be a regulation that even though if I'm the commander in chief, even though I'm in civilian clothes, that I can return a salute. He taught me something. He said, I think if you did it, no one would say anything. <laughs> so I salute every time I see a uniform. But, uh, well, because of our young men and women in uniform, things have really changed around the world. You know, America used to wear a kick me sign around its neck, but we threw that away. And now it reads, don't tread on me. And today, today, every nickel and dime dictator around the world knows that if he tangles with the United States of America, he'll have a price to pay. One other thing I'm especially proud of after six years of this administration, not one square inch of territory in the world has been lost to communism, and one small country, Grenada, has been set free. Yeah. And finally, there's another special issue. We remain committed to our decision to move ahead with our Strategic Defense Initiative Against Ballistic Missiles, SDI. Uh, today, we're dealing with the Soviet Union from a position of strength, and it was SDI that brought the Soviet Union to the bargaining table. Let me pledge to you, our goal is to keep America strong, to save the West from mutual nuclear terror, to make ballistic missiles obsolete, and ultimately to eliminate them from the face of the earth. And incidentally, in doing that, so there's no confusion, while SDI is not a protection against anything other than the ballistic missiles, I mean to include ridding all nuclear weapons from the face of the earth. SDI is America's insurance policy to protect us from accidents or some madman who might come along, as Hitler did, or a Gaddafi, or just in case the Soviets don't keep their side of a bargain. The record on Soviet treaty violations is clear. We can either bet on American technology to keep us safe or on Soviet promises, and each has its own track record. I'll bet on American technology any day. Now, I knew there were those who had their doubts, but flying back from Iceland a few weeks ago, I knew the American people would support firmness with the Soviet Union. So I couldn't come here today without thanking you, each of you, for that support. Yeah. 
Now, in a crowd like this, I know there must be a number of Democrats. And yes, now wait a minute, wait, wait. Going across this country, I've seen the millions of fine patriotic Democrats who have come to realize that their leadership is totally out of step with their beliefs. And since we're outnumbered in the House of, House of Representatives, if it hadn't been for the support of some of those Democrats, like those who might be here today, uh, we couldn't have achieved what we've achieved in these programs. Now, as you may know, I used to be a Democrat myself until I learned that the liberal leadership of that party had become completely out of step with the hardworking and patriotic men and women who make up the Democratic Party. I, to all these bands here that I recognized, I have to tell you a little personal story because it kind of fits in right here. I was the drum major of the Dixon, Illinois Boys Band. And, uh, uh, We were invited to a neighboring town to lead their Memorial Day parade. Well, we didn't exactly lead it because in front of us was the parade leader on a big white horse. We're going down the street and the band is playing and I'm pumping the baton and he turned and rode back down the line of parade to make sure everything was coming along all right. And pretty soon, I began to think the music was sounding faint. And I glanced over my shoulder he had come back up and caught up just in time to turn the band to the right down an intersection. I was walking up the street all by myself. <laughs> and that's what happened to the Democratic Party. The party has turned to the right. The leadership is still walking to the left. <laughs> you know, in this thing of changing parties, though I know how tough it can be to break with tradition, but remember, there's a great example set for us. The great statesman Winston Churchill was a member of parliament. Winston Churchill changed parties, and he was criticized for it, but he gave an answer that says it all. He said very simply, some men change principle for party. Others change party for principle. That's what the election here in Washington State is all about this year, principle. Slade Gorton is a man of principle and integrity, a man who is devoted to his state and the people he represents, one of the nation's most respected and effective senators. You know, every time Slade walks into the Oval Office, I can't help thinking of another great senator from your state, Washington, Scoop Jackson. Uh, And like Scoop, when Slade sits across a table from you, he has the courage and honesty to tell you what he believes, whether he agrees with you or not. I've seen him in action, making a reality of Scoop's longtime dream of a home port for the Navy at Everett. And believe me, he's about the most effective fighter any state has on Capitol Hill. A perfect example. A perfect example is the issue of selecting potential sites for a nuclear waste repository. Slade has told me about his deep concern for the health and safety of Washingtonians, particularly as it relates to this issue. On this point, Slade has gotten the ears of everyone back in the nation's capital. Now, as you know, there were plans to begin work at Hanford this fiscal year. But Slade, working with Dan Evans and Mark Hatfield, persuaded the Congress to adopt a provision that stops the drilling of an exploratory shaft for 12 months. And, uh, and Slade has alerted me that some people have suggested that this administration might intentionally circumvent the law. Well, that's the kind of thing that touches my temperature control. 
And let me tell you that I will see to it that the law on this issue is followed to the letter and let no one tell you differently. The most liberal elements in the Congress in opposing our strategic defense against nuclear ballistic missiles, even after I returned from Iceland, he, he said he was, in his words, dead against SDI. Well, we're dead set against a weaker America. We're going to keep our insurance policy for peace. With Slade Gorton in the Senate, we're going to negotiate for peace from a position of strength. And the choice here in Washington State couldn't be clearer. Slade Gorton was a leader on the team that brought America back. Slade's opponent was an all-star player on the team that got us in the mess in the first place, and he hasn't changed his uniform yet. So please, on Election Day, keep our team on the field. Go to the polls. Get everyone you know to go there, too, and send Slade Gorton back to the Senate. If, before I leave all this subject of strength and everything, let me just explain, if I could, for some who might not understand, and I've come across many people who don't understand SDI and what the whole proposal was about. We don't believe that the world should go on with a policy of mutual assured destruction in which our only defense against nuclear missiles is to have so many on each side that both sides are afraid to start the fight. We believe that if there is a defensive shield that can make those weapons obsolete, we should put that in place, but not put it in place while we have our great arsenal of nuclear offensive weapons. In Iceland and since then, my proposal to the Soviet Union was that when we come to the point that we have developed and know we have this defensive shield, then they and the United States come together we agree to eliminate all offensive nuclear weapons, and we, in return, give them the same shield we have so that we can live together with no suspicion that each other might be cheating. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the eyes of America are on you and your great state. Will you choose the Democratic leaders who in 1980 weakened our nation and nearly brought our economy to its knees, who raised your taxes and have announced their plans to pursue a, well, well, or will you give us a chance to send the cleanup team of 1980 back to finish? Now, um, you've, you've gotten ahead of me a little bit here because, um, I thought I'd conduct an informal poll and you would speak up loudly and let all America hear. For example, do you want to go back to the days of big spending, high taxes, and runaway inflation? No! Do you want to return to policies that gave us a weak and vacillating America? No! That's good to hear. <laughs> Now, would you rather have low taxes, low inflation, and low interest rates? Yeah. Would you rather have an America that is strong and proud and free? Yeah. Do you want Slade Gordon as your senator from the great state of Washington? Yeah. Oh. You, you, uh, you just made my day, and you didn't make Slade a bit unhappy, either. <laughs> well, but important as this election will be to me, it'll be even more important to you, and especially to you young people, for this will shape our nation's future. Every poll shows that the age group from 18 to 24 has the highest percentage of any age group in being supportive of what we're doing. Now, uh, but now, I have another poll return also. So when you go out of here, I'm going to send you on a mission. 
That is also the age group that shows the lowest turnout for voting at the polls. So go out of here not only determined to vote yourselves, but buttonhole every friend in your age group that you can and tell them the only way to be a good citizen is to get to those polls and vote. Exercise your sacred right as an American. Participate in shaping history itself by going to the polls. You know, at the beginning of World War II, General George C. Marshall was the Chief of Staff of the United States Army. And someone asked him, as we went into that terrible war, if we had a secret weapon, and if so, what it might be. And General Marshall said very simply, yes, we have a secret weapon. It's just the best blankety-blank kids in the world. Now, I've been seeing your generation on campuses all across the country, in high schools that I visited, those young people in the military and all, and I can assure you, if George Marshall were here today, he would say, your generation, you're the best blankety-blank kids in the world. I had to say blankety-blank and not what he said, but generals are different than presidents and what they can say. Well, it's time to go now, but before leaving, uh, yeah, yeah, I got to go over and visit Steve Sims in Idaho. <laughs> but before leaving, I would just like to say that people my age deeply believe that it's our duty to turn over to you young Americans the same freedom and opportunity that our parents and grandparents turned over to us when it was our turn to take charge. And speaking for other generations, those between my generation and yours, all of us feel that same way. Now, there have been times, just a few years ago was one of them, when we have been careless and things have slipped for America. But we've always gotten back on track as we are now. And so I pledge to you that that's what we want to do and we're going to turn over to you that kind of a free and oppor opportune offering society here in America. Thank you. When we look at you and see your openness and your enthusiasm for America and for life itself, believe me, it gives us heart. So when you go to the polls, win one for Slade Gorton. Win, win one for your future and win one for America's future. And I can't resist saying it, win one for the Gipper. <laughs> Thank you all, and God bless you. Thank you. Mr. President, we want you to have uh, something very special and quite unique to remember the real Washington by. Now, there are some of us who weren't fortunate enough uh, to go to either of our great state universities, and we have to walk a very careful line. You fall into that category, too, so we're going to present you with this sweatshirt.